Okay. Let me know when you're ready. Here we go. We're recording. So welcome, everybody. And Paul and I have talked about this, and I know I've talked about this with a number of you, is not too many of us have money conversations with each other. And I'm so grateful for the people in my life that did have money conversations with me. And uh, Paul is one of those people that I was introduced to uh, and brought Kenny along years ago um, when I first started in Juice Plus. And between Gordon Hester talking in my ear uh, about things that we should be thinking about and doing and Paul's guidance to get it done, we're, we're approaching that retirement age with full confidence and security about our future. And I want to make sure that the people that I love and care about are, are feeling that same way. And so that was what this call was really about. And uh, with that, I just want to introduce Paul. And Paul, if you'll share your screen, I got a quiz for you right off the bat. So this is Paul's company, uh, Sound Financial Group, and wanted to ask you, um, these are all articles that appeared in Huffington Post, Inc., Entrepreneur, Forbes, and even Octane. And what do you think all these uh, articles about entrepreneurs have in common? Any guess? Looks like we messed up in calculations. <laughs> Actually, it is uh, the the thing that they all have in common is that the they were authored by Paul Adams. So it's really exciting for us to have him uh, on here with you. And with that, Paul, I uh, just want to thank you for all the help that you've given us through the years, and that you're still giving us. And looking forward to what you can share. Yeah, thank you so much. It's a great introduction. It's great to be with all of you today. Uh, as one point of clarity, only one of those was authored by me and all the rest were interviews. And what the theme that happened over and over again and why things caught on with Forbes and Inc. and Entrepreneur, uh, Huffington Post was kind of out of left field. I didn't expect that one at all. I guess they have a money section. Uh, I had never seen it before until I read an article about me on it. Uh, and funny story, I learned about it because a brand new employee Googled me. And they're like, oh, did you know about this? And I was like, no, I didn't know it had been published yet. So, uh, so that's, uh, it's always fun to, to look at those articles. I, uh, my reason for us chatting today is just to be able to give you all some thinking. You know, Lenora talked about conversations around money. But the thing is, for the most part, people don't have conversations about money, number one. Number two, they don't share enough background to clear up what I would call uh, the current, the morass, the noise that surrounds all of us about money. And what we're going to do tonight is just talk about some of those things, all things that involve our philosophy, things you would find out about if you read uh, our book. Uh, which if you let Lenora know you want a copy of our book, we will absolutely send one to you or if you sat through our philosophy conversation or if you listen to our podcast. So it's all meant to let us give away a whole bunch of our knowledge and thinking. People that it resonates with may want to have a one-on-one -on -one philosophy conversation with us and I'll talk more about how our process works in a moment. Uh, but it's just meant to take care of all of you so that you become better consumers of financial knowledge and information as you move forward through life. Now, yeah. if, if anything shows up for you, like you've got a question, an aha, something that you want to share or understand more about, don't hesitate to stop me. Uh, I can be hard to stop, sometimes like a freight train, though uh, if you chat Lenora, she will definitely stop me because she has no problem slowing me down. Uh, this is our uh, client process and the way that we work when we do work with clients, which I think will just give you context for our philosophy. Now, we have uh, uh, an initial conversation with somebody and it's just meant to see whether or not we should have a philosophy conversation. That philosophy conversation, when we have it with people, we don't charge for it. Our, our opportunity is to share with them what we do. And the only thing somebody can do if they have that conversation with us we don't ask them any deep questions. We do not ask them to open their kimono. The only thing that is available in that meeting is people can ask to apply to become a client of ours. And we, we review that and we try to make sure that it's gonna be ethical for us to engage people because we do charge a fee. So that's a big thing for me. 
I don't want to charge somebody something and not, not feel like I could justify what they were going to pay. So that's why the application process, all of that, but keeping us away from a sales type format. And then we do a design set of strategies that are meetings all meant to deliver like blueprints, like an architect to somebody saying, here is the way you could handle your money. But much like an architect that has, like you can work with an architect, they have a build side to their firm and that architect can build it for you or you go get your own general contractor or you head Home Depot and you get a bunch of nails and you get some hammers and you go at it yourself and you follow the plans. So we try to make all of that available for our clients when we engage and they know that they're engaging us for a fee and we're giving them advice and we're giving them the design based upon that fee. So that's just a little bit of general background. Now, as we do this, I just realized, Lenora, I may not have shared my audio, so I am going to reshare that screen with the computer audio. And I'm, I wanna share this video with all of you because now I've shared with you a little bit about me, a little bit about my firm's process, but you may be sitting there going, gosh, bless it. Is he gonna go on like this the entire time and be a little worried about how the rest of this is gonna go? And I don't know if y'all have seen this, but this is a video that was done by Pepsi where Jeff Gordon took somebody for a ride in a car that was quite a surprise to him. Now, I'm not gonna have us do the entire video. Oh, but you're gonna hear pieces wow. of it. Yeah. Nice uh, and easy. By show of hands, how many of you have Head seen on this out. video? Whenever you're ready. Are you ready to go ahead and yeah, Several drive? of you, okay. okay. Sure. And Lenore, I don't know if you spotlighted me. Oh. <laughs> Uh, in the Sorry. thing. A little more than I'm used to. Oh, is great. And of course, this guy gets get a feel wildly for surprised. Okay. By he feels totally Okay, shy. all right. He's off just a little bit. He's off. I'm thinking and the guy a little, screaming, more age on me, some wrinkles, uh, Jeff Gordon. a little dorky, uh, maybe some facial it's, hair. It's right about Somebody that I can favorite part where pull off a, a fun prank with. <laughs> Let's go have some fun. But if you watch the entire video, since so many of you have seen it, what you're going to notice very quickly is that at the very end, he says, can we do it again? After he knows he could trust the guy driving the car. But before that, before he knew it was Jeff Gordon, he didn't know if he could trust it. So he didn't want to be in the car and he wanted to get out as bad as he could. You guys may feel that way. In fact, you deserve a trigger warning for the conversation tonight. And that is that we're going to talk about the kinds of things that really do have the ability to mess up somebody's finances and mess up our own futures if we're not watching out for them. Some of it will not be great news and you may not take it as great news. But if you don't yet either have something to take notes on on your phone or a piece of paper, I would highly encourage now's the time to go get that because I'm going to start teaching some key distinctions and principles that will affect how you deal with money. Now, we're going to start with the bad news, and that's the problems about money that you run into that nobody talks about. And the reason we run into these problems and nobody talks about them is everybody's working to market products to us. And if somebody's trying to market products to us, you know what the big problem is? If you are being delivered bad news, it's not very likely you're going to transact with that company. But if they give you great news or sort of medium news, you may transact. So how many of you have had the opportunity to see like uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off or uh, any of Ben Stein stuff? You, you guys remember this guy? As a kid, we got a few hands up. It's great. So Ben Stein, a lot of people don't know, is actually considered to be one of the most brilliant economists, as well as being a very dry actor. Now, Ben Stein was being interviewed after he had written a book actually called How to, I think it's called How to Financially Ruin Your Life, or it's How to Really Screw Up Your Life Financially. Believe it or not, that was actually the name of the book. And he went through in a book and wrote all his financial mistakes. And he's being interviewed by a British reporter, financial reporter, and I can't do accents, but the British reporter, picture a British accent says, now in, in your book, you talk about you, the biggest problems people have. What do you think the biggest problem is the American public has with money? And he says, well, it's, it's, it's the debt, you know, the, the debt that people have. 
and he says, oh, of course, like, yeah, see, that's, I can't do it. But credit cards, uh, car loans, mortgages that are out of whack, student loans, that kind of, and he says, in his very dry way, he goes, no. The debt that people owe them future selves. If you think about it, we're all walking around and we owe something to our future selves. Today, in financial terms, it's called a net present value. But there is money that is owed one day to our future self. And the question is, when we do meet them, what's it going to be like? Are we going to be like, hey, I wanted you to know all these years, I held off and buying a few things. I made some decent investments. I was diligent and prudent and had good stewardship. And you're going to be fine the rest of your life. Or you're going to say, hey, bad news. Uh, healthcare is going to be tough. We're going to have to live with the kids for a while. And uh, I do want to let you know, though, I really enjoyed driving all the cars I drove all these years. Just super sorry about you not being able to buy or keep your home in old age. Now, that's you can kind of see why I gave you the trigger warning. So let's talk about the specific mechanics that line up to best enable you to have a good conversation with that older you when you one day transition into the financial decisions you are making right now will one day be the ones that future you has to live with. Now, I will say there's a very funny comment. I never watched the show Friends, but I had friends that watched the show Friends. And they said that, the, I think it's Joey was the character, would say, well, I'm not going to worry about that. That's a tomorrow Joey problem. Well, these, <laughs> what we're about to talk about is the tomorrow you problems. And it probably makes more sense to deal with them today than to wait until much later. Okay, so here's the mechanics we want to be aware of. And these are the things I'm going to have you tag and write down on your list. But the first is protection first. And after each one of these bullets, give yourself a gap and make sure that you can make some notes underneath it because you're going to see some notes. Next is an idea, and it's an economic theory called survivorship bias. And it really messes up a lot of how we think about money and how we even think about our own results as entrepreneurs. Then the numbers 4, 65, and 94. 4, 65, and 94. This next one is the difference between you at work and your capital at work. Those are two very different things, but they don't seem like it. I'm going to show you the difference. The idea that savings for most people is residue left over versus really building assets. And then I'm going to teach you how to do cash flow control for your household using my own, my own circumstances from 2014 of how you can manage your finances from the bottom up. Okay. So let's start with this idea of protection first. So let's say we were just going to build a castle hundreds of years ago. And why did we build a castle anyway? It wasn't because they were super comfortable. It was because they had walls. They might have a moat like this particular one in the picture, but they had protection around them. And before we moved any of our valuables to that new area, we would have first dug the moat and built the wall. Now, we're not going to talk at all about protection today, but what I do want to point out is before you address anything else that we're going to talk about, you have got to make sure protection is squared away because it's not obvious to us the protection. Now, back then it was easy. All you had to do is dig a lot of ditch around your building and move a lot of heavy rocks. And you got a wall and you got a moat and you were in good shape. The problem is today that we don't think enough about protection before we start taking action. Okay. We just don't think about protecting it properly. If we even go back to early America, Let's take the 1800s as an example. If we were all out west and we were uh, in a small town and we looked around and we would wonder who had money. Well, we would know who had money simply because we would know that Lenora and Kenny had, it looked like about 5,000 head of cattle. You might know that I owned the bank in this city and the next city over. Pam and her husband owned the saloon. <laughs> <laughs> in that town and one over. And so we, have, we, we had evidence of what assets looked like. So it was normal. If you read early writings in this country, being frugal was actually normal and it was a virtue. Why? 
because the stuff that you purchased actually was able to be seen by others. The things that were assets were visible. So our biological urge to shake our peacock feathers was also aligned with long-term financial security, but it's changed. Now the things that you do that are responsible financially are not visible like a castle. The things that you do responsible financially are actually seen by nobody. And all the signaling, all the peacock feathers that you will have or that other people will see are all going to be things that are consumption, things that are not assets, things that are likely losing money. And we're going to come back to the definition of an asset in a few minutes. But when we think about how easy it is to forget to protect ourselves first because we can't see it, the truth is we can't really see any of our assets anymore like we used to be able to. So it's just worth a moment to say, you got to make sure your car insurance, homeowner insurance, umbrella policies, life, disability insurance, wills and trusts are all squared away before you do one of these other things. Okay. So let's talk about survivorship bias. The first of those things I had you write down. Now, if you look at World War II, and when I get a chance to talk to a large room of people, I'll usually have one or two serious World War II, like fanatics who can answer every trivia question. And I, I'm always tempted to ask, where do you think we won World War II? And I get answers like uh, D-Day and Normandy Beach, uh, Japan when we dropped the second bomb, uh, or in the Battle of the Bulge. Like those were all turning points. People credit it differently. And here's what I would challenge everybody watching tonight, is that we won World War II in a relatively smoke-filled small apartment in Harlem, New York. Now, I know that sounds like an answer you wouldn't expect, but it's because there was this department that did all the math for everybody out in the field. The generals would gather all this information and send it over, and these guys that didn't have calculators, they had like slide rules and chalkboards, okay? And they would do the math, and there's a, one man in that room named Abraham Wald. And what came in, was this airplane. And it was an airplane with a bunch of scatter graphs. There were tons of these. And the general said, we need to know, how do we better armor these aircraft so they can deliver their payload and make everything, you know, they can deliver their bombs and get far enough, but we need to armor them better because they're getting shot up really bad. And so they started to do the math. They had finished the project. They were sending it back out. What they had to do was say, we're gonna armor the areas you asked us to from the bullet holes, but they're going to carry this much less fuel, meaning shorter range, and this much less in armaments, meaning less bombing capacity. And it was about to leave. And Abraham Wald stopped the project. He was working on another project. He saw it and he said, we're studying the wrong aircraft. If you look at this scatter graph, what you're going to notice is there's no shots anywhere in the cockpit. There are no shots whatsoever in the engines. And there are no shots in the weakest parts of the wing and tail. He said, we're studying the wrong aircraft. You guys took all of these data points from the planes that delivered their bombs and returned all shot up. But in fact, we need to study the ones that didn't return. And what they found out is all they needed to do was armor the cockpit and the engines. Maintained our air superiority over Europe and we won World War II. Now, why uh, that's all like, great, Paul. Now I have a new piece of trivia. I'll share that at a wine tasting sometime. What does that have to do with my money? It's this. When we look at our money and we look out at the field of people and you look at the people that live in your neighborhood who are retired, people that go to your church who are retired and they all seem to be doing okay. The thing is that we think it's easier to end up retired than it really is because we see people who are doing it successfully. It's not so bad. The problem is the ones that got crushed. I'm going to talk about what the odds are of them just getting crushed by the reality of old age without money. They're not living in your neighborhood anymore. They pr probably are not going to church anymore. If you're golf, they're not on the golf course. They're not going to the gym with you. They have moved to somewhere else and they're just not a part of your view anymore. And we make an assessment that it might be easy enough to get there but we're using incomplete data just like they were back in World War II. So we have to be clear about what it takes for us to get there, not assume it's easy just because of what we can see. So AARP came out with some stats. This is years ago, but they're still valid today. 
that only about 11% of baby boomers are going to be able to retire in the same standard of living that they had when they were working. In fact, AARP said similar. Now, if that was an airline, I don't think any of us would call that an 11% success ratio. <laughs> we would call it an 89% failure ratio and we would not get on that airline. So for us, we need to realize that's the real number is that for the most part, one in 10 are who gonna make it when you look around. And if we wanna be that one in 10, like the reason Lenora set this up today is she wanted to contribute to everybody enough that you can get yourself out of the one in 10. And wouldn't it be great if when you get to your old age that everybody that's around you was responsible enough that when you wanna go celebrate in Hawaii, they get to go. And they don't have to stay behind, they don't have to keep working, but they do have the opportunity to be with you where you are. Okay, so let's talk about that 4% number. 4% where you wrote that down, I want you to write behind it is the amount I can take every year. I'm gonna illustrate this with a story of two brothers. Now these two brothers worked at Boeing, you know, just like regular engineers, went through the years, and they invested a bunch of money. Both of them saved up money in the 401k. They did the exact same thing. I mean, like any little brother, he just did everything his older brother did. And they went through all the years doing what they said they would do, growing their money, and they get their retirement. Well, at least the first one does, and he's five years older. And this is what his retirement looked like. He took, as you can see, $80,000 a year of income. Well, that's pretty good. He had a million dollars, he took $80,000. Now, you already should pick up that I said 4% was the most, but he's taking eight. And look, it all worked out. The market did wonderful. He put all of in the S&P 500 index, worked out great. By, the, by 1999, he had $2.6 million. So little brother, five years later says, hey, I got the same million dollars I just started 10 years after, or five years after you, what do I do? He says, easy, put it on the S&P 500 index, take out $80,000 a year, and you should double your money in five years. Like any good big brother, he's perfectly happy to have his little brother do what he said. But it didn't work out so good for little brother because the market didn't cooperate. And the problem is, even if it, the market were to average 8%, it doesn't do it in a linear fashion. It goes up and down. And by, when I say market, I don't just mean the stock market. If you're a real estate investor or any asset that's going to get you a halfway decent rate of return is going to have variability in how it goes up. So in this case, taking out the 8%, and I, earlier this year, spent 40 days in Wyoming with my family, and you spend 40 days in Wyoming, you start using some country metaphors. So when you take out too much money, it's a little bit like eating your seed corn. You gotta make sure there's enough seed to keep the field planted. In this case, he ate his seed corn, and in as little as five years, he has less than half the amount of money left. That doesn't work, that's why it's 4%. So. For every $40,000 of income you want to replace, it requires a million dollars of capital at work, somewhere. And, and the problem is people are not usually thinking that way. For most of you, and this doesn't mean everybody, but most of you here today, you all have a great business, you have you know, incredible passive income, that I think you, you, all of you are probably seasoned enough to know you gotta keep running the business, it doesn't just say passive forever. But one day, like any entrepreneur that owns a business, We've got to build our financial security on our personal balance sheet, as well as continuing to build the business. Now, the other reason why it's 4% is you are gonna last a super long time. So, how many of you just think to yourself, at 65 years old, what you're hoping to do is to be a total mess physically, near death's door, and hoping only live three or four years? I see a lot of head shaking. <laughs> And that's just it. We don't want that. But in fact, we don't think about how long we are actually likely to live. So when you open up USA Today, at least that's my favorite paper for like a silly chart and in infographic. They've been doing infographics before infographics were cool. And they show something that says your average baby boomer. The male lives to age 78 and the woman dies at 81. And that's true for baby boomers if you count all of them. But when they use that stat, they're counting healthy baby boomers, sick baby boomers, poor baby boomers, 
rich baby boomers. The mentally well, the mentally unwell, the guy that's having his third Burger King Whopper like today, like everybody. But when you arrive at age 65, if you've taken care of yourself financially and you've taken care of yourself physically, you live a long time. There's a 50-50 chance that in a married couple, one of you is going to make it to age 95, 94. And this is what those odds actually look like. These are actual numbers from insurance companies, not like, you know, just a guess or based upon all of society, like people that were healthy enough to actually get insured at age 65 live a super long time. And when I say mortality is age 94, that means half live longer. That is not an end point. That mortality point is the midway point. And you can see on the graph, lots of people live longer than that. One of the two live that long. So we go, okay, I gotta live, I'm gonna live a long time, got it. 4%, got it. So that means we gotta have money set aside. Well, that's the difference between you at work and capital at work. Because we just think of cash flow. It's very normal for us to relate to cash flow. We went through our entire career thinking of cash flow. Now, this is an example of somebody making $400,000 a year. They say, I need $400,000 a year. And when I'm old and I retire or I reach what we call financial independence, I also need $400,000. And we sort of leave it at that. But that's not it. When we get older, we can only take 4%, which means it takes a lot of money to produce $400,000 a year. And this is what that comparison looks like. And I'm going to show you with some other income level so you can see it. But right there, that is the same, that blue is the same 400,000. That little tiny thing at the bottom. And that orange is 10 million. We have to have 25 times the amount in capital at work to produce the income that we want to enjoy and at least have some significant idea that it's gonna be reliable for the rest of our lives. Now, depending on your level of income, changes how big that capital at work number needs to be. And it's, once again, it's not little. Like even $100,000 of income that we want per year means we gotta have two and a half million dollars in capital at work somewhere so that it can kick that number off every single year. So a side note, if you're on the call today, and you make $200,000. Well, next time somebody says, how do you feel? Don't say, oh man, I feel like a million bucks. What you should say is, I feel like five million bucks. Because that's the amount of capital it would take to produce the 200,000 that you're going to the marketplace and transacting for every year. Like that is not a small thing. That's a lot of human life value, but it's highly problematic if we're not ready when we get there. Now, not all assets are created equal and not all the people that you think of as wealthy are wealthy, okay? Now, this is our most popular YouTube video. It's called When 22 and a Half Million is Not Enough. When is 22 and a half million not enough? We've all driven by those homes we see the beautiful house on the water, 55 foot yacht, and we imagine they have a vacation home too. We imagine that these people are unbelievably wealthy. Let's walk through the math. A $10 million home, $2 million yacht, $3 million second home. That's a pretty good life. Now what do you think it takes just to maintain this stuff? $130,000 a year in property tax just to keep the two homes. $40,000 to maintain the yacht, and another $130,000 to maintain the properties. That's $300,000 a year just to keep the stuff they have. This doesn't include having them go out for dinner, take a vacation, buy groceries, or put enough fuel in the yacht to really go out and enjoy it. How much capital is needed to fund $300,000 a year of maintenance? We know it takes 25 times the amount of cash flow required in capital at work to sustain any cash flow. So we would need seven and a half million dollars of capital at work to fund this $300,000 a year. Meaning this household could be worth 22 and a half million and be broke or headed toward broke. 
they have $15 million worth of stuff and they need another $7.5 million just to maintain the stuff. In fact, at this level of lifestyle, they would need another $20 million of assets to withdraw 4% a year and have an income of $800,000 hoping to keep $500,000 a year after taxes. All of this assumes that they owned all of the stuff free and clear with zero debt. That means the person with a $10 million home, $2 million yacht, and $3 million second home is not balance sheet wealthy until they have $42 million total, meaning they have enough in assets to fund their lifestyle. We drive by and see people with these lifestyles not realizing that just like the rest of America, they're likely balancing their consumption on the knife's edge of their income. You see, these people may have a $3 million income that allows for this lifestyle to last for now. Though without the $42 million of net worth, they're not likely balance sheet wealthy. Now here's where this lands for all of you. So what does this matter to you? Well, three reasons. One, you should keep this in context when you see people who look like they're wealthy. In our subconscious, their consumption is likely to draw our own spending higher. Know that most of the people are still not balance sheet wealthy. It could be like a hollow chocolate Easter bunny. It's just not as solid as it first appears. Number two, once you know that, you no longer allow the upward pressure of other people's consumption to influence your spending. In fact, if the person with the $10 million home is no longer influencing us, how much less likely are the advertisers or a neighbor who just bought a Mercedes likely to influence us? Number three, put yourself in these shoes. Just take a zero off of all the calculations. What if it's a $1 million home, $200,000 boat, $300,000 second home, even with no mortgages, $13,000 in property taxes, $4,000 in boat maintenance, $13,000 in maintaining the two homes. That's $750,000 of capital we would require to produce the cash flow of $30,000 a year to maintain the stuff. If we want to also have $80,000 of income and keep about $60,000 after tax, that's another $2 million of capital at work. So even someone with a million dollar house may need a total of $4.2 million of net worth to be balance sheet wealthy, meaning that they can sustain it without working. So I ask you, are you on track? Do you know if you're on track? That's it. That, you can watch the rest of the video. I will say that if this has been valuable to you today when we, we're not done, but when we are done, I would encourage you to go find Sound Financial Group on YouTube, grab that video and share it because that will, it does get people's attention and the people that you really care about haven't watched the whole thing. Because every time we drive by those beautiful houses on the water or whatever their super cool neighborhood is around you, we think those people have it together, but all statistical evidence shows us that they don't. And I'm going to talk about a place you can access some of that information, but we're going to get to the solutions. I've just given you a bunch of problems that exist out there. And I don't want to leave you guys hanging without being able to have something you could actually do today. So number one, we got to escape the current. The current is like the way everybody's currently thinking about money or business or whatever marriages, like marriages aren't working out. Like we've got to get away from the way everybody else is doing things so that we have a greater likelihood of success. But if we're not careful, we just float down the river with everybody else and we don't stop long enough to realize that we may be headed toward a waterfall. So there's four books that I think are super strong at getting us out of those common ways that everybody's thinking about money. The first and most impactful for me, and it's just the way my mind works as a man, is stop acting rich. Now, Unfortunately, Dr. Thomas Stanley gave this the worst possible name because there is no more offensive book to recommend to somebody than, hey, I, really, I think you'd enjoy this book. It's called Stop Acting Rich. Now, his prior book was The Millionaire Next Door. If he would have given it a softer name like that, I think it would have sold way more. Now, rest his soul, he's not going to get another shot at it. He died in August of 2015 in a terrible car accident. But the gift that he gave us in his last book here, if you ever read The Millionaire Next Door, he talks about people with over a million dollars and how they live and how it's different. And it was helpful. 
But what he talks about in this book is how much net worth do you have, how much money are you making, and are, are you likely to be able to intersect with enough capital at age 65 and beyond? And he calls being on that track or better than that track balance sheet wealthy. And then he calls everybody below that line aspirationals. People that are living and spending in a way that is not going to take care of them getting to where they want to go. Or you may call them income affluent. So he does a great job in that book. And as a guy, when I see somebody with a great car, I remember after reading this book and getting steeped in his doctrine, I think you all had probably seen, at least on TV, I had before, but I pulled up to a hotel that I sometimes have lunch at. And there was one of those Mercedes super fast cars that have the doors that like looked like they, you know, they're saying you scored a touchdown. It was really cool. The, those doors were open. The guy was getting it out. And I found myself like, man, that is really cool that you have that car. And I had no desire for it. Because just like my metaphor in the video about a chocolate Easter bunny, now I know from this book what the odds are his entire other balance sheet looks like. I just don't care to have his car. Now, the other books on here that are great are Simplify by Joshua Becker, Youth Pastor, and he tells the story at the beginning of the book about being out in his front yard. And he's with his teenage son, and they're cleaning up and raking and doing the garage and all sorts of stuff. And his neighbor across the street was doing it too. And they're getting ready to go to lunch, and they're kind of waved like, hey, see you after lunch. And he yells back, isn't it funny? We work all week to buy all this stuff, then we work all weekend taking care of it. And as he walked in the house, Joshua Becker, he just blew his mind. And he's like, I am not going to do this the rest of my life. And he talked about not necessarily spending less money all the time, but thinking differently about money, making sure you're only buying the things that you actually care about and building some practices around that. Now, the book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, is by far the most woo-woo book you may ever read. The last few chapters go as far as to say that what you should do at the end of the day is take your shoes, look at them, and say, thank you for keeping my feet warm all day and being comfortable, whatever, or making me look good. Like, no kidding, with every article of clothing. Okay, I don't do that. But what I did get from her book is some super practical stuff about decluttering life. How to do it when you do it with a spouse, how to set the rules of conduct about how you do it so you don't end up punching each other in the face as you go about it. And then last, but I think definitely not least, and maybe one of the most impactful books I give to people is the book Satisfied by Jeff Mannion. This book takes the themes from Ephesians and Paul's writing to the people of Ephesus, which was very much a cosmopolitan place, much like America is today, and talking to believers in that time about being more aware of their spiritual disciplines and cultivating contentment rather than being swept up in what everybody else is doing. Now, I want to pause on this idea of cultivating contentment. Cultivating contentment is very different than lowering your standards, which is what most people have to do one day. I don't want to lower my standards. What I want to do is go about being incredibly, deeply grateful and content because I said the mission of our firm is design and build a good life. What comes with that is you have to design it. You have to pause, get out of the rat race long enough, be in a coaching conversation with someone like Sound Financial Group, but someone who who can help you choose what do you actually want life to look like and then build toward it. Part of that for me has been my autonomy and freedom to work from wherever I want. I mentioned about being in Wyoming for 40 days earlier this year. And right now for the entire month of October, I'm down in Newport Beach with my family. I'm working a few days a week, but I have set up my life and structured in a way that I get to do this this way, working with people from wherever they are and wherever I am just location independent, but that didn't happen overnight. It took design and it took us making some moves to cultivate contentment in the way that we want to do things. And that's not the financial side, but this book applies to everything else in life. And if you're somebody that doesn't give any particular testimony to faith, this book is still highly applicable and I could not recommend it enough. Okay. Let's talk about 
how to build wealth. And the best way to do it is stop thinking about putting money into savings accounts. Now, I know that sounds weird. I'm basically saying to build wealth, you need to stop saving. But I'm going to tell you a story of something that I went through. And this is something we've been talking about for nearly two decades with our clients that we need to get away from savings accounts as a vehicle. Now, here's why. If I get a chance to talk to a really large audience and I ask them, what is it most people sometimes do with savings? The answer is always some version of spending. They build money up and they spend it. Now, I went to a Chase Bank branch. I was speaking at a conference in Ojai, California. I decided to take a walk to the bank one night to get some cash out of the ATM. And I happened to walk into the bank for whatever reason instead of the ATM outside. And I saw this. And I was like, you know, maybe these banks are changing. Now, I took this picture on my iPhone and I thought, maybe they're really changing things. Like, they're going to really get teach people to save and invest in a... And then I looked around and I saw some other signs. Now I'm walking around a bank at night in Ojai, California, taking pictures of my cell phone. I'm like, are they gonna call security? But this was the first one. What are people saving for? 38% for travel. So we're just gonna save up and spend money on travel. 24% to spend on a home. Well, we might also be saving 56% of people were saving for an emergency. So we could spend it on whatever the emergency is. 29% are saving for a car, 23% for a kid's education, and 26% for home improvement projects. Now that is the picture of every single one of those signs. There was not like another sign that said, save it up so you can get really wealthy and build a strong balance sheet, and not have to borrow money from this bank anymore. That was not one of the signs. It all had to do with spending so that what we would do is keep the cycle going because the banks, I don't know if you think about this, Banks only make money if you borrow. They don't make money when you deposit. Okay. So then we say, okay, I get it. We need, I need to set money aside for assets. Good. I think I can do that. All I'm going to do is budget. Budgeting by itself doesn't work. If you have ever tried to teach a 16-year-old how to drive a car, you can't do it with budgeting. Or, I mean, you can't do it by telling them to look at the curb. Now, what do we try to do when we're budgeting? Focus on spending, focus on spending, focus on spending. Well, just like telling that child, don't hit the curb, don't hit the curb, watch the curb, what do they do? Boom, they hit the curb every time. Now, this is one of the most popular budgeting spreadsheets on the internet. And here's what I wanna call your attention to on the right-hand side. Income minus spending is the net, and the net is what you're gonna save. So what you're saying is that the, everything I've done, all the work I've done, everything else, and what's gonna show up for me for the long run for independence one day from this career, I'm leaving as residue. Yes, that's what our entire society teaches us to do as it relates to saving money. So we wanna tilt that on its head. And we're gonna tilt it on its head by teaching you to set up a wealth coordination account. That's something I want you to write down right now. Wealth coordination account. Now, wealth coordination account has a very specific purpose. Number one, it is a checking account. I know that's going to sound strange that I'm saying how you're going to build wealth is with a checking account at first. Well, number one, we want to escape all of this cultural meaning that makes savings be spending money. We need to escape that. The first way we do it is set up a checking account instead. Then its only purpose is to buy assets. And the money you put in and if you're, if you're giving charitably and you're tithing, that's the first payment and this becomes the second payment. But for everybody else, this should be the first bill you pay every month. People talk about, oh, you should pay yourself first. Well, how's, it doesn't work. But if you say, I am going to, as soon as I get my check, I am putting X into this account. Set it $25, it doesn't matter. If you've never done it before, never saved before, it will work and begin to change your behavior because it's an action. It's not a 401k, it doesn't come out automatic. You've gotta take an action to put money in that account every single month. So at least monthly, you're taking and thinking about your long-term well-being. when most of the time people don't think about it until they get within spit spitting distance of retirement. And here's our definition of an asset I promised you. This is worth writing down if you can write as fast as I can talk. An asset is anything that puts money in your pocket now 
or has the ability to put money in your pocket in the future without changing your lifestyle. Now that's key. That means that your primary residence is not an asset. Because if you live like where I am right now in Newport Beach, well, you could sell your really cool beach house and you could go move to Gilbert, Arizona and you'd have a bunch of money left over after you bought your house in Gilbert, Arizona. But you had to have a change in lifestyle. It's very different to live in Gilbert, Arizona than Newport Beach. So that a primary residence, even if it's paid off, not an asset. What kind of things could be assets? Well, I'm gonna show you a quick case study of how this might all play out. You know, a family makes $400,000 a year. Now they save 20% of their income, which not for our whole conversation today, but 20% of gross is really where people should get themselves to at a minimum. $80,000 a year goes in and they start buying assets. Vacation home that's rented, that provides cash flow, definitely an asset. Collectibles that are not part of your lifestyle. So if you have a 54 and a half Corvette or whatever Corvette is really valuable from the 50s and it's in the garage with the cover on it and you maintain it, that could be an asset. But if you're in a Corvette club with a bunch of Corvette friends, not an asset anymore. So I hope that creates the distinction for you. Uh, real estate, of course, could be an asset. Certain types of life insurance could be an asset. Mutual funds, small business ownership like y'all's businesses. Then all the regular stuff you'd think about. 401ks, IRAs, all assets. Even investing back in your own human life value or your human capital, definitely an asset. Like going to conferences could be an asset. But this is where it becomes really key what you do differently. And that is that you wanna produce passive income with whatever assets you own, and we need to make sure those land back in the wealth coordination account. Here's why. Everybody's had some chance. Sell a home, get a big bonus, whatever it is, and it lands in the regular checking account, and you intended, you really did, you intended to save and invest that money, but, but you just felt a little more flush, and you're like, you know, we've been thinking about getting you a new car or you know that place in, we could go to that Hawaii trip if you want. It's not like we spend all of it, but some of it gets lost in the sauce of life. So to overcome that, what we do is we put the money and the profit from those assets back to the wealth coordination account so it can make its way back out. Now the next piece is really key. Look at this family, they make 400 a year and they're saving 80. So no matter how you slice it, somewhere they're consuming 320,000. Now you could, if you're making $100,000 a year, divide it by four. If you're making $800,000 a year, to multiply it by two and you're gonna get the same numbers. What we wanna do is eventually get that passive income high enough to pay all of those bills and all the consumption, okay? When you do, you've reached DFI, not retirement. And I don't want any of my clients to retire, if I could help it. The reason I don't want them to retire in the traditional sense is to retire an old set of golf clubs and mean to give them away, put them up on the shelf, but it has nothing to do with ever using them again. I don't, nor do most of my clients want to build a career where they built knowledge, relationships, networks, they're adding value to people and then just quote unquote punch out because they have enough money. So when you reach DFI, it's a unique shift. And that is that definite financial independence means you now can save 100% of your earnings. So think about that for a moment. How different does every job, every career, every business get if all the money you make at it goes directly to savings? Like what kind of autonomy? Could you look at certain clients and go, nope, I'm not working with you because I don't have to because I'm just gonna save 100% of what I make anyway. And all of your future income increases come because you're driving so much to your wealth coordination account and it's buying assets and those assets are providing for your income. One last point on cash flow control and we are landing this plane. And that's cash flow control from the bottom up. So this is my family's actual budget. It doesn't from 2014 as a percentage, okay? Now it doesn't matter how much income you have, you have 100% of it, okay? For us, that year was about 12% between tithing and additional giving that we, we did. We also paid 28% in taxes. We lived in a state with no state income tax. And this is the tax from the dollar one all the way up. And that's the tax on the 100% of which we already deducted 12. So definitely it's a tax bracket that hurts. We're working every year till the end of March to pay or till the end of April to pay somebody else. Savings of 25% of gross, leaving our lifestyle at 35%. 
So that's, that's it. That's how we live that year. But here's the thing people miss is let's say they wanted to go buy something. What almost always happens is to make room in the lifestyle for the thing they want to buy. They crowd out something above. They crowd out their giving, they crowd out their savings. You, you usually can't crowd out the tax man. So it's basically going to come from your giving or from your savings. And most everybody takes it from the amount of money they would set aside for asset building for the future. But I've always thought it'd be really cool to have a yacht. And in a moment, you're going to see why I don't have one yet. Now to have the yacht that I want, it's $5,000 a month. That's got to put money down on it. It's going to be financed. I'm going to have fuel in it because I'm not going to be one of those people that says I can't take the thing out because I can't put fuel in it. It's going to be insured. It's going to be well-maintained. Oh, and it's got to be at a dock and mooring that's close enough to me, which is not inexpensive, so that I'll actually go down and use it. 5000 a month. Now, for some people, they look at that. Number one, they look at that purchase and say, well, it's only, the financing is only $2,000 a month. I can do that. But they forget all the accompanying costs. So this is all accompanying costs to start with on the new consumption item. Second, if I take $5,000 a month and add it to my lifestyle, that means I got to add more cash flow overall. So I'm not stealing it from any other buckets. So what else do I got? Well, I got to start saving an additional 2,500. I got to start paying an additional $4,000 in taxes. I need to give an extra 1,700 a month, meaning my boat purchase is nearly a $15,000 a month decision. And my wife and I have an objective here in 2018 to live off of 20% of our income and save or give away 80. This, this yacht isn't getting any closer to being on my dock because that just became, if you walk through that math, if lifestyle is only 20%, that means buying this yacht is now a $25,000 a month decision. I think we'll do without a yacht for now. So in our process, if anybody wants to engage, we have a conversation with you. We revisit some of what we talked about today and teach you a couple of other concepts about how to invest and deal with your money. And if you wanted to, after that conversation, you could ask for an application. If you were super inspired by our conversation today, you could go ahead and reach out to us and ask for an application now, and we'd be happy to review it with you and see if we'd be a fit. Uh, but just as an additional free gift, if you text me at this number, 425-786-4238, what I will do is make sure you not only get this book, this is actually a book written by the president of my firm who I brought in. He and I've worked together for years. He took off like four months to write this book and when he came back into the workaday world from that little mini sabbatical, I brought him in as the president of my firm. It's part of the reason why he's there running the show right now so I can be in Newport Beach, California, California having this conversation with all of you. But I'll also make sure my staff sends you my book called Sound Financial Advice. They'll revisit some of these concepts, et cetera. If all you do is just text me your name, Lenora will make sure that, uh, she's volunteered to make sure that we get your mailing address and we'll drop those in the mail to you. So uh, with that, I, that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions. I hope this has been really valuable. And I'm really hopeful I didn't go wildly over time because I've not been watching the clock. I think you might still be muted. Take us off a of screen share so we can uh, uh -huh. see everybody. Yes, everybody. can do. Does everybody that? have that number for, uh, for Paul? Um, Cause yeah, I hope you'll do that. And, and all I can tell you is that, um, we have, he has helped us so much to uh, guide this journey that we've had these last years. And Kenny and I always said, we read a book. There's one I'd add in addition to what he talked about, and that's Richest Man in Babylon. We talked about that earlier today. Uh, yes. Just principles of wealth. And you can see from this conversation that this is not what we're, this is not what Americans do, right? but we have tried to have this discipline since Kenny and I were first married uh, to save around 20% of our income and um, to finally be at that point where I'm saving most of my Juice Plus income towards retirement has, is just a huge accomplishment. And um, 
I, I know that he will help you. Uh, here's from Debbie Rudloff to everyone. Oh, you have to get up for another Zoom. Debbie, uh, so we're going we're gonna to stop the recording in a second, but I wanted to give you guys a chance if you had a burning question for Paul uh, that he could answer before we let him go. Oh, Debbie, you're on mute. Unmute. I, I muted everybody. I'm sorry, just so we had a quiet call. Go ahead, Debbie. We enjoyed the info, um, but Good. I need to run because I've got an appointment for another Zoom that I'm hosting at 7. So. Okay. Right on. Thank well, you so much. you're very welcome. Okay. Yeah, we got the number, so we'll text you for the book and we'll go. Right on. Okay. Right on. You got it. Anybody have questions? Should I take it off of the record? Let's see. How can we access it? um after this zoom call is over How can okay. we actually good question let me stop hang on just a second let me stop